The contracts question from February of 1996 is a very typical question. Here's a hypothetical that's just like every other hypothetical involving a contractor and a homeowner. Have a look with me at the call of the question. What claims and defenses may owner and ace reasonably assert against one another, and what is the likelihood of success of each? Discuss. Well, we can outline this call of the question without even reading one word from the fact pattern. We know there will be two lawsuits, owner versus ace and ace versus owner. Each one of them will have one or more theories of liability, and we know that the prayer for relief can include damages, restitution, and equitable relief, either in torts or in contracts. We know that one of the parties is named owner, so almost certainly this is going to be a problem that involves real property. Maybe it will deal with real property ownership, maybe it will deal with some tort theory involving land, or maybe it's a contracts question involving a contractor. Regardless, we know that we're going to have two lawsuits. Each one will have two sections, a theory of liability and a prayer for relief, and we'll find a home for all of the details internally. Going to the top of the question, we learn about a contract between owner and ace, and we get the dates of the agreement as well. We know that the deal was for the painting of owner's house. We know that the price is $4,700. Now, the first paragraph is extremely subtle, and a lot of people who didn't read carefully made a grievous material error right from the beginning. Look at the second sentence. On July 1, owner calls Ace by telephone and then indicates the time is of the essence. But wait a minute. Look carefully at the dates. The contract was signed on June 1. Owner is calling Ace to inform him the time is of the essence on July 1. This is a common law agreement, and that extra new materially different term, time is of the essence, has to be supported by consideration. Now, if this was the UCC, it still wouldn't be any good, because then we'd have to have a writing. So right from the beginning, we see that owner may not be able to assert any claims against ACE for ACE's failure to adhere to a time is of the essence clause. That clause has to be in the agreement at its beginning, and it is not. We find out in paragraph one also for the reason that owner wants this time is of the essence provision in the deal. Owner wants to sell this property and owner wants to be able to make it into the sales season with a nicely painted home. In paragraph two, we begin to see that Ace is going to breach this agreement. He falls behind because of the weather. And that can give rise to an impossibility or impracticability defense. And that idea is made clear in the third line of this short paragraph because we are told that Ace would lose money on a number of jobs if Ace had to stick to the schedule. And the result, the painting job isn't done until almost three weeks late. Owner lists the house for sale on September 21. Paragraph three tells us about more crucial facts. This is a short pattern, and every one of these details is relevant. Every one of them needs to find a home in your answer. The house stood empty, and owner made no effort to rent or otherwise make use of it. That goes to mitigation of damages. We know owner is the plaintiff. Owner is going to be suing for breach of contract based on Ace's failure to finish the job on time. We can already see that that breach is a minor breach because time was not of the essence at the time this contract was formed, and also because the parties never separately agreed to modify that earlier agreement to make time of the essence. We find out also in paragraph three about the selling season. Had this house been painted on time, it's a little bit more likely that it would have been sold. But notice, the sales season really runs from May to October, and so at best, owner's house only would have been on the market for the very last month of that sales season. Take a look at paragraph four. This sets up the lawsuits. Owner won't pay Ace for his work. That's the breach by owner. Ace has sued owner 
for $4,700, which was the purchase price. Owner denies liability, counterclaims against Ace for $6,000, that money representing the interest on owner's mortgage during the time that the house sat empty. Then we get the call of the question again, a very straightforward call. We are asked about these two lawsuits. Now, I choose to answer this question in the order that the call asks for, owner versus ace, and then ace versus owner. It would be satisfactory to organize it in the opposite order, ace versus owner and owner versus ace, if that would make it more convenient or easier for you to do on time. Flip the page and have a look at the outline of issues that I've presented, and you'll see, once again, I follow the approach that I've set forth at the beginning of this lesson. We're not doing anything especially innovative here, but we are being careful and meticulous and thorough. It's a short question. We need to find a home for every factual detail, and the outline that I present allows us to do it. We begin with owner versus ace. Owner's claim is based on breach of contract. I focus on the breach, and I focus on owner's claims for damages. These are consequential damages flowing from ACE's failure to complete the job on time. Then I turn to ACE's defenses, and ACE has a lot to say in defense. Remember, the most crucial lesson from the approach to contracts is the defendant in a contracts action can aggressively defend himself or herself at three different stages of the analysis. The defendant in a contract case can deny the existence of the contract, defenses to formation. A defendant can have defenses to breach. And then, finally, the defendant can offer defenses to remedies. And in this case, ACE has fairly good defenses across the board. Clearly, ACE has no defense to the initial formation of the contract. And that's no big deal. ACE is suing on the basis of that contract himself. But ACE does have a strong defense to the modification. And this was the issue that most people who were going to do poorly on this essay missed. Owners sought to modify this agreement with the phone call a month after the contract was formed. As we've seen, that attempt to modify the agreement fails. Owners stuck with the agreement that owner made at the beginning, and the result is ACE has a good defense to liability under owner's lawsuit. Next, we turn to ACE's defense to breach. ACE has got an impossibility or commercial impracticability, frustration of pur purpose defense. Now, I don't absolve ACE of liability. I find ACE to be in breach, but I find the breach to be a minor breach, not a material breach, as it would have been had this time is of the essence clause been a part of the agreement. Next, I turn to ACE's defenses to owner's claim for damages. First, the issue of foreseeability. Since the time is of the essence clause wasn't part of the agreement at the beginning, and since ACE had no knowledge of owner's possible risk of damages, the foreseeability issue goes in favor of the defendant. Plus, we've got owner's failure to mitigate, letting this house stand empty and making no effort to monetize the property during the time that it was empty. All of this adds up to a failure to mitigate. Unfortunately, we don't get, well, actually, fortunately, we don't get a lot of math to do uh, in order to figure out the extent to which the mitigation could have been in play. Still, in the end, I conclude that although ACE is in breach, that breach is a minor one, and owner will be entitled to de minimis damages. Next, we turn to ACE versus owner. And once again, we've got the classic situation of a contractor who is himself in breach, suing an owner. So ACE is going to be suing under the contract for breach, and in the event that ACE is found to be in material breach, something I find him not to be, then ACE would have to fall back on restitution, suing for the benefit conferred on owner. Owner also will try to impose some defenses. They're weak. The result is ACE prevails. So now, let's have a brief look together at the model answer that I've written for this fact pattern, and we'll see I am not doing anything very complicated here. This is a classic example of me following my own advice and applying my own techniques. You'll see right up front, I lead with the facts. 
I indicate that owner's action is a counterclaim arising out of the contract. I lead with the idea that this is a common law agreement, so those principles, rather than UCC principles, will govern. I focus on the nature of the contract and its terms, and on owner's theory of breach. Next, I turn to the consequential damages owner seeks. Now, you'll notice there's not anything in here really about offer acceptance consideration. The contract basically is one that we can stipulate to. But I frame this answer around ACE's defenses because that allows us to really focus carefully on where the issues are. Now, could one have written a good answer to this question following a more traditional offer acceptance consideration format? Answer, maybe. But it would be a lot more difficult to do it that way within time constraints than to answer the question in the more direct, straightforward, and responsive fashion that I have chosen. So we see that ACE really doesn't have any defenses to formation. But ACE does have valid defenses to breach, which I pay a fair amount of attention to. Finally, I conclude that ACE will not be held to the time is of the essence provision, and then I turn to ACE's defenses to breach. Ultimately, I find that ACE's defenses to breach aren't very persuasive. But fortunately for ACE, I find their breach to be not a material breach. Next, I turn to ACE's defenses to remedies. Here we focus on foreseeability and on owner's failure to mitigate. And please realize the call of the question in this hypothetical is asking us about defenses. So I am giving them what they want by narrowly and specifically identifying ACE's defenses and carefully analyzing them. Finally, my conclusion is that owner doesn't get the damages that owner seeks. Next, I turn to ACE versus owner. And you'll notice this analysis fits into fairly three fairly compact paragraphs. I've already done the bulk of the work in replying to the original lawsuit. But here I'm explaining that Ace will sue under the contract for breach, or alternatively, he'll sue for restitution to avoid the unjust enrichment of owner. Owner really doesn't have any defenses. Once we conclude that the time is of the essence clause isn't part of the agreement, owner basically is hung out to dry. So my conclusion is, ACE is entitled to full payment under the agreement, the $4,700. Owner's claims are not persuasive because the time is of the essence clause wasn't a part of the agreement. So my result is ACE wins. ACE obtains all of the relief that ACE is seeking, full payment under the agreement, and owner has to make do with losing. <laughs>